Hello, and welcome to the first edition of T2RL Talks. This is our new podcast series in which we hope to shed a little extra light on some of the subjects for our research. Today, we're featuring two of my colleagues from T2RL, but in the future, I expect we will have some very interesting guests for you to look out for on this podcast. You can find the podcast wherever you find any other podcast you're interested in. And if you subscribe, you'll be sure to get the first look or the first listen to our experts. Today's subject is transition to normality. Um, About three years ago at T2RL, we started to track the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And gradually over time, we've realized that that's not the only external event that's influencing our industry. So as the COVID pandemic seems to be receding in significance, although it's far from gone away, we're starting to track some of the other externalities that impact our industry. And here to discuss those things with me, we have my two colleagues. We have Yuna Huelu, who is our VP distribution based in Auckland, New Zealand, and for her, it is currently very early in the morning. And we also have Bert Craven, who's the head of our airline technology practice, who is in the UK. And so for him, it's early evening. So welcome, Bert. Welcome, Yuna. Thanks, Ian. Good morning. The subject for today is transition to normality. And I guess we might want to start by thinking, what is normal for this industry? Um, is there such a thing as normality for the airline industry? I've been working in it for 40 years, and I'm not sure that there is. But uh, what do you think, Bert? Is there anything like normal? Yes, there is. I mean, you know, I, I think people are kind of they're looking back on 2019 as the sort of benchmark for where the industry should have been. And, and we should naturally have, have, have gone on from there had we not been rudely interrupted. And I think there are kind of standard industry statistics that we look at all the time about passengers boarded, about load factors, about yields, about capacity and available seat miles or available seat kilometers, passenger mix and so on. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of these numbers are coming back, but they're coming back in different order, as it were. So PBs are starting to climb to 2019 levels and in some cases have exceeded 2019 levels. Load factors are returning, but capacity hasn't come back in in full yet in some markets. Passenger mix, um, by all accounts, has shifted towards um, leisure. I business is coming back more slowly than leisure, and I think capacity is being held out of the market. And networks have not returned to what they were in 2019. Networks have definitely been thinned. And I think that what we're likely to see, this may, be, this may be the last thing that returns to normal. And in fact, it may not ever return to what it was um, in 2019. I think we've got a lot of airlines now who are very considerably leveraged as a result of, of COVID-19. Capital discipline will, will be an absolute priority. And so routes that they may have been operating before the pandemic, which were maybe prestige or vanity routes or routes that weren't necessarily quite as profitable as some of the others, we may not see those come back. And if there's a better use for a piece of metal, even if it's getting rid of that piece of metal than flying it at lower margin, then we may not see the thickness of the network's return. You know, New Zealand had really quite a different experience of the pandemic to most places in Europe. How does it look from the other side of the world? We, we definitely did, didn't we? The first year was was quite similar in some ways, but we opened up a lot faster. So in some ways, the domestic experience was was business as usual, with the caveat that you couldn't really leave the country. Um, that That is a big caveat. That's a big disruption to people's lives. And so the pent-up demand that we've seen out of New Zealand and coming in has been absolutely um, gangbusters for the last few months, and that's the same in other parts of the world as well. Um, our our economy has suffered greatly from it, as have other countries. Um, there's a, a lot of um, there's a lot of damage that's been done that needs to be undone, and that's going to take another couple of years. Um, but what we're seeing is quite a different um, type of traveller at the moment that's coming in and out of New Zealand, and I think that's a similar trend 
to other parts of the world, but it's just magnetized because we're just such a small country that we just see a lot, a lot more of what the trends are, I think, in such a small population. Are you seeing the same kind of thing that Bert was talking about, that um, some sectors like leisure, VFR is coming back a lot faster than corporate? Corporate seems to be the, the real laggard in all of this. Yeah, if we bunch all corporate together, then yes, it hasn't come back to the same levels. Um, VFR is incredibly strong, but we do see different types of um, what I would still consider a corporate customer traveling strongly, and that would be SMEs. Um, so small, medium enterprise have gone back to pretty much 2019 levels on this side of the world. Um, it's a very, very, um, there's a lot of demand there. It's the larger corporates that seem to have really changed their policies, changed their way of looking at travel and what they consider necessary. And also, I think a lot of that is not necessarily down to budget cuts or um, a lack of want to travel. It's actually the the risk. Corporates do tend to have much stricter policies in terms of duty of care for their employees, et cetera. And when there's too much unknown um, and too much potential for disruption, if you're going to do a, a, an expensive business trip to the other side of the world, but you don't know if you're actually going to make it for the two-day meeting, it, it becomes quite a different decision to make, doesn't it? Definitely, yeah. I, I think there's a, there's a couple of, of, of things that are in that long tail of COVID. So even after the the immediate effects of COVID are starting to recede. The perception of risk will take longer to change. And the long tail of economic impact will affect people's ability to travel or willingness to pay for travel. So I think willingness to pay from a risk perspective and willingness to pay from an economic perspective are likely to, to tail off much more slowly than sort of genuine and immediate risk of a pandemic, as it were. I think that the people who have taken the brave, brave decision to, to spend quite considerable amounts of money to go on trips, especially on, in the VFR segments in the last few months, their experience has not necessarily been the best. We've seen mass disruptions. Pretty much everyone I've spoken to who has gone on a trip in the last few months has lost a bag. Everyone's lost a bag at this point, right? Um, and so when people are making really expensive decisions on, on trips, um, that experience, I think, is going to make a difference on, on their choices and their willingness to actually go on that next trip that they had all the enthusiasm for a few months ago is probably dampened a little bit. So I, I do think that we will see a little bit more of change. Things haven't stabilized yet in terms of the actual um, true demand that we'll see in 2023. Looking at a couple of the other regions in the world, we don't have any of our North American colleagues uh, on this conversation, but the impression I have is that domestic business in North America is back to pre-pandemic levels. Mm. Um, international is still perhaps a little bit depressed, but the perception of risk amongst our American friends is is very much that traveling domestically is safe, whatever yep. you come across, but traveling internationally is still a little bit unknown. And then the other big market that is really standing out at the moment is China. Mm. It seemed at the end of 2020 that, that China really had COVID licked and China opened up domestically very, very fast, very, very strongly. But in the last two, three months, things seem to have gone quite badly south for, for China. And I think that's going to have quite an impact on patterns of travel and patterns of, of airline business over the maybe several years to come. No, I think that's right. Um, you know, and I think we sort of we've been calling out this out for some months is that recovery is going to be patchy. Countries that have a large domestic network and large domestic business are going to recover m more quickly. And we thought that China might be in that group, but sadly have, have, have not benefited from their early sort of very stringent lockdowns and so on. I think we're going to see business come back in, in dribs and drabs and, and there won't be a kind of a universal experience of this. It's going to be uh, definitely quite patchy. Well, one of the big impacts, of course, during the depths of the pandemic when air travel was almost came to a halt, never, never quite halted altogether, but almost came to a halt, is that airlines, of course, laid off a lot of staff and airports laid off a lot of staff. Yep. And that resulted in, in the phenomenon that Yoon is talking about, where it's hard to restore service when you've lost a lot of experienced staff. There's a, there's a longer tale even than that, I would suggest. Um, I think the whole travel, transport, hospitality industry, 
were massively impact. And there are shortages of staff um, for a variety of reasons in different markets now where um, people were either laid off or left those jobs voluntarily, and they've just not been able to scale back as quickly. I think there were some some poor decisions made about anticipating the return of volume, particularly by airport authorities and, and airport management companies. I, they were overly pessimistic in, in judging the return. But also the amount of time it takes to bring people back into some of these positions. I mean, generally, you can hire hotel staff and bar staff as long as they're available. But people working airside in an airport have to go through a three to six month vetting process in some cases. And so you can't just ramp those people up at a at a moment's notice. And I think we're currently sitting in, in the long tail of some poor staffing decisions. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. And I think it's twofold. I think there's there's the ability to be able to ramp up operational staff um, quickly has is, is always been a challenge for airlines. But as we move forward, um, like what you mentioned in China and things being patchy, airlines are going to have to be able to to make really quick changes to the amount of staff that they have on the ground and the airports are in the same bag. Um, and I don't think that they have the technology just yet to be able to do that and 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 react fast enough. The other thing that that this has accelerated for airlines in particular is we were, I think before COVID, a lot of airlines were already on the brink of a bit of a, a generational changeover. There were a lot of people in the industry that have been there for a very long time. I've worked in in an airline where, you know, having 20 years seniority was considered a new starter. Um, and there were a lot of um, very experienced and knowledgeable staff who um, possibly accelerated their, their retirement and their exit. And there's been huge losses in, um, in knowledge. Mm. Um, and that impacts pretty much all the airlines that, that, I can, that I can see. And that you can't replace. There's new technology coming in and we were already on the cusp of a, of a lot of digital disruption. Um, but that's going to have to accelerate. But unfortunately, the the holders of the knowledge of some of that really complex industry specific technology and process are potentially not there anymore. And we're seeing that having a huge impact on operations for a number of airlines. Yeah, and I think that that's definitely true. It is the the brain drain, the knowledge loss in the industry has been quite marked. And and I guess that brings us to our interest in this as T two R L. To what extent? Is it possible to fill some of those gaps using technology where we've lost experienced people and we've lost numbers of people? To what extent can we fill those gaps with technology, if at all? I, I, I think there are definitely um, opportunities. I mean, um, I, I think enough airlines have gone through enough digitization that what happens over time is that best practice gets embedded in the technology. I, the, the technology companies build technology around established processes, um, and then those pieces of technology propagate that best practice through the use of the technology in, in many airlines. It's almost a formal practice. Uh, an airline customer will help write the process manual for a given piece of, of technology, and then that will be sold to all of the customers using that piece of, uh, of technology. So. Um, it's definitely problematic, but it's not irreplaceable. I think it will slow things down and it will make things a little bit more difficult. It is very difficult to unpack and digitize long established processes if the people who understand why they are the way they are are not there to explain it. Um, so that is going to, that's going to slow things down a bit. I, I, I think as an industry, um, there are enough consultancies there's enough free roaming knowledge to kind of spread this around and, and things will evolve right a lot of airlines still have um, quite significant IT projects that need to be completed to simplify um, some of their tech stack as those um, more complex bits kind of get get replaced over the next few years new technology comes in the some of that complexity is going to hopefully disappear. I surely hope so. Um, and, and you will have new owners of, of those processes that have come in with the new technology who will be comfortable with it. And it, it's just not going to be the same level of complexity in the standards and architecture as we've seen in the past, hopefully. Some of the, the, the conversations that we've had with people about the likely impacts of changes from sort of traditional models to new offer order settle deliver models um, have been focusing 
as much on the organizational impacts and the fact that this is going to change process. It's going to change the skills that are going to, are going to be required. It's going to change the way that people are required to think. Yeah. Um, uh, so as much as the technology will change, there will also be um, a kind of a human and process impact on airline capability as well. To a certain extent, if there is a revolution coming, we're going to be facing a whole lot of change anyway. And some people will probably find that their historical knowledge gets devalued fairly quickly as we as we step forward into not necessarily um, simpler, but certainly where more of the complexity is handled uh, uh, underneath the, uh, the surface, as it were. If you're able to introduce new seamless processes that work for 80% of your customers 80% of the time and they're fully automated and really smooth and deliver a great experience, that allows your teams as an airline and, and with your technology partners to then focus on that 20% that's left that is more complex that might require manual intervention. Yeah. Um, but you organize around that. And we haven't seen yet that many situations in the industry where the technology has easily and quickly enable that 80% to be fully automated and smooth. And that's going to be huge gains for the airlines, huge gains for customer experience that come from that. I think there will be there'll be other benefits as well. I mean, the idea that you can create systems that the users who interact with them don't need to necessarily understand all of the detail. That means that your ability to take people off the street, as it were, or out of university or whatever it is, and get them trained up to do a job means that the level of specialized knowledge that they require in order to carry out a relatively complex task is less. And the time spent training them is shorter and, and, and so on and so on. So I think that of, there are definitely benefits that we will see from that. Yeah, I think to some extent, the holy grail of this kind of automation and digital transformation will be when we can go through an event like the the major weather event in in North America a couple of weeks ago and have our automated systems pick up all the pieces, get people to where they need to be, get their bags to where they need to be with less disruption. You will always have disruption from a, a major weather event, but I don't think we're anywhere near achieving the levels of of smooth automation to, to deal with those events yet. No, I've worked in in disruption quite quite a few times over the last few years. There will still always be those scenarios where nothing works out. Your planes are in the wrong place. Your staff are in the wrong place. Your customers' bags, everything is is all over the place. And and those situations still require additional staffing and additional manual intervention. And you, your teams to be on board in that. And I think actually that that leads us to the, the other point when we were talking about staff um, earlier and that ability to scale up and down at, at short notice. Um, technology can help with that as well. It's not all about the automation. Where I think there's a huge opportunity is around the predictive analytics, where we've got systems that we're looking at, you know, wh- when is demand going to spike, et cetera. That, that's interesting and that's great for revenue and price, but actually being able to predict when you're going to have disruption, when you're going to need to have more staff, when you're going to need to have more um, spare parts when you're going to need to have more luggage capacity, et cetera. Those are the things that will make a, a huge difference as well as the technology that helps automate the recovery from the disruption. Let's move on and look at some of the other big externalities that, that are impacting the industry. And, and the obvious one, if you're sitting in Europe, maybe a little less so if you're sitting in New Zealand, uh, is, is the fact that we've got a, a war going on in Europe for the first time in, in two or three generations. And, and that's had some obvious impacts and, and, and maybe some less obvious impacts as we go forward. One of the big impacts for our the industries that we are concerned with is, of course, that the Russian airlines have been um, forcibly ejected from their Western technology providers. And that's caused a bit of a shakeup. Uh, and, and maybe one of the impacts of that, if we look forward to when this damn war is concluded and and we return to normality on that front is that will it make those russian technology uh providers stronger competitors in a world market when they are free to compete on the world stage in three five years time i think we definitely have to consider that as a possibility i mean normally the thing that would have prevented them from growing would is the availability of 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 better competitors in the market once those are removed, um, there's nothing quite like 
capability being forged in the heat of necessity, as it were. Uh, and I think that a number of those vendors are going to have to up their game considerably and will probably get the support of the Russian government in doing that out of sheer necessity. Whether that in the long term then translates into them being able to compete better on a global stage is, is, a, is another matter. But I think it will have to improve their capability out of necessity. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's very clear. We, we looked at some of the numbers and I, I think everybody listening to this podcast will understand that we, uh, we count PBs as our main metric of, uh, of, of most of the systems we look at. And it's something of the order of 40 to 50 million PBs have been removed from the two Amadeus systems and from Sabre and, and essentially handed to the two big Russian suppliers. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall during October when they were trying to manage those migrations, but we haven't heard any adverse reports from those migrations. Let's also bear in mind, though, that that you know a, a lot of Russian air traffic at the time was grounded, and if you were going to do a PSS, you were going to have a PSS migration forced on you, that would be the time to do it. Um, and it's not just the the commercial systems. I mean, you know, all of the operational systems will have had to have been migrated as well. There will be a lot of, of areas, whether it's MRO or, or ops or crewing or, or any of those things. Domestic vendors will definitely have um, have benefited. And and we have to bear in mind also that Russia isn't it's it's not completely isolated from the world. Um, it still counts a, a few friends, some of wh whom have technological capabilities, not least of all China. We don't know whether the Russians have had basically access to, to, to Chinese technology in order to help boost uh, or at least stabilize their, their transition. Yeah, and, and, and I'd add to China, I'd add India, because there, yep. uh, the, there is still a degree of commerce going on between Russia and India. Mm -hmm. And of course, India is is a powerhouse of um, technology development in the modern world. Yeah, and at the end of the day, if, if, there's a, if there's money being spent, there will be somebody out there who's prepared to take it. Thinking about the, the maybe the other impact of the conflict in, in Europe, um, the closure of Russian airspace, and, and that's affected the routes uh, flown between Europe and, and Asia and uh, Europe and Australasia. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think Air New Zealand doesn't operate the eastern route anymore to... Uh, Not anymore, to... no, no, no. So, so there's no immediate impact there. No. One of the learnings from, from the last few years has been that everyone needs to just have more resilient um, businesses that are able to adapt to change faster. And we, we're probably going to touch on, you know, the, the risk that comes with weather events and, and, and climate risk. So being able to adapt and, and fly different routes um, and the implications that that has on fuel and operations, et cetera, that's going to become the new normal, whether it's caused by conflict or by other events. I, I don't think that's going to go away. It will be a, in a different part of the world in a few months when something else happens, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that's true. And you know, one of the big impacts on the world of aviation when the uh, when the conflict started in Ukraine was a sudden spike in fuel prices. Mm. Uh, we've actually seen over the last two or three months, aviation fuel has actually come down back to more or less the level it was immediately before the invasion. But in the interim, uh, it spiked up by a, almost fifty percent, and, and and I think that's you know, to your point, Una, there are going to be more events like that. There are going to be more events that, that hit availability of routes or affect price of fuel or some other piece of technology that the industry relies upon. So I think one of the themes that I certainly perceive in the recovery from the pandemic and, and the return to normality is the premium on flexibility, robustness and flexibility even maybe at the expense of the, the, the last scintilla of profitability. Maybe we're ready to accept just a few points lower on, on margin or a few points lower on revenue in return for increased robustness and increased flexibility. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, there, there's other factors in there that, that we don't necessarily think about. I was just thinking back at, at what happened when the conflict sort of really hit. Um, we, we we were impacted down here. You know, I, I've heard jokes about, you know, the French not having mustard on the shelves, et cetera, and just all these unforeseen consequences that, that just ripple through the world. 
one of the big ones here has been um, not not only inflation but um, currency fluctuations, and that's just such a huge impact on the airlines. It's you know it impacts on demand with travelers not not being able to to afford to come into the country. It impacts on your technology costs. You, you just just complete full exposure these days. The smallest little event having a, a, a ripple effect. We, we always talk about fuel, but I think um, looking at the currency, the financial risk is is going to be just exponential every time now. We just can expect these shocks to happen every six months or every nine months, even at this side of the world where we're, we're probably as far as we can from the conflict right now. It, it's impacting us too. There are some people who will have been more heavily affected by the closure of Russian airspace than others. You know, you think poor Finnair, you know, and mm. just the number of routes they must have had that, just, that went over Russia that, that aren't available to them now. Um, and and other carriers in 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 Europe, more, more specifically. I mean, to some extent, um, we probably benefited to some degree by just how tight Russia had been about its airspace previously. I they had a policy of only granting one carrier per country navigation rights. Um, so there will be some people who were probably having to fly around Russia before anyway. Hopefully that will that will reopen. But if it doesn't, you know, the industry will will find a way to adapt. You know, the the Russian airspace has really only been open since since the kind of end of the Cold War detente. You know, th- this situation has existed before in the history of, of of commercial aviation. I think we will 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 find our way round it. Um, inconvenient though it is, the broader economic impacts. I think Yuna is absolutely right. You know, the cost of living crisis in some places effects on foreign exchange. Uh, general cost of living, not just aviation fuel, but gas driving up other prices, has had a very, very uh, broad impact. Knock on effect. Yeah, not it is. It is absolutely those knock on effects, and 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 um and and they 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 tend to sort of swirl together into these little perfect storms that um that can have that can be very unpredictable, actually. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. I I, I think we we can. Sp- sit here and we can have a conversation about this effect or that impact or that phenomenon but really everything is interconnected the and 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 the knock on effects are absolutely real another major externality that kind of interacts with the others that we've been talking about is, is the climate crisis my exposure to this started a long long time ago when i was at university i took a degree in physics and even back in the 1970s, when I was at university, we knew about the greenhouse effect. We knew that the climate was going to be impacted by burning of fossil fuels and so on and so on. It's taken 40 years for the world to generally accept that this thing is real. Mm. And as a result, some of the impacts now are going to be much more severe than they would have been if if, if pe- people and governments had started to take action back in the 1980s, 1990s. The airline industry is in a very strange position compared with many because it's both a victim of the f- climate crisis and uh, a contributor to the climate crisis. Mm. And, and I think that's causing some connections, certainly uh, in, in our friends in Geneva, IATA's responses to the climate change have been... Um, <sighs> Less than ideal, I think, is is a, a kind way of putting it. But maybe we could just think about it in, in, in two ways. One is the short-term impact, and, and the biggest short-term impact is the increase in extreme weather events. You know, we've, we've seen heat waves in Europe. We've seen, perversely, extreme cold striking North America a couple of weeks ago. But I think as an industry, we've got to expect that these severe weather events are going to become more frequent. And that brings us back again, I think, to the the, the, the questions of flexibility and robustness in our systems. Mm. I think we have to think about it in, in two forms. One is our ability to affect reality, you know, to do things like, you know, to adopt sustainable aviation fuels to, to genuinely reduce um, climate impact. And then the other one is about affecting perception. I suppose to a certain extent, avoiding the drinking straw effect. Um, you know, there was the, you know, this whole thing about ocean plastics, and you know, less than one percent of ocean plastic comes from drinking straws. Thirty to forty percent of it comes from industrial fishing, and yet the entire world marched down to their local bar and demanded that they stop using plastic straws. 
simply because they were going there anyway and they didn't know any industrial fisheries and that would probably involve standing in the rain or something. So it was easier to have a pop at the barman in your local pub about plastic drinking straws, which have a, a tiny impact on ocean plastic, than address the 30, 40% of ocean plastic that comes from industrial fishing, right? The, the, I think the airline industry needs to, needs to think about how it's portrayed both as Ian, as you said, both as a victim and a, mm. uh, and a polluter. The reality is that huge quantities of um, human activity, whether it's the fashion industry, the construction industry, farming, all of these activities have a climate impact. And what, it, what it's about is, is, is the trade-off of benefit for, for impact, right? The air industry has been probably more heavily scapegoated and, and more unfairly targeted than, than, than many. And I think that's inevitable. Um, the airline business is highly visible. Yeah. You know, if you if you live in or near a city, you see airplanes flying overhead every day, and you hear them, and sometimes you see the contrails, and you think, okay, that's not doing us any good at all. Yeah. But I think you're absolutely right that we need a more rational analysis. The airline industry contributes to that about two and a half percent of of current greenhouse gas emissions. Now, two and a half percent is still a hell of a lot of CO2. And the airline industry should, like all other industries, should be doing its bit to reduce as far as it can the, the, the emissions that it that, that it makes. But I think today it's treated as a as a kind of a very easy target. It's still to a certain extent seen as the preserve of the rich um, and a thing that we could just do without and so on. And and I think some of that can be left to the conscience of the individual consumer. And some of it is going to be legislated. I mean, we've already seen some legislation in some countries saying that, you know, journeys of, of, a, of less than a certain distance, you're not going, there's going to be no flying of those anymore. You basically have to take alternative means or go by train. And I expect there will probably be, be more of that as well. Um, but the airline industry needs to find, it needs to find the right balance in terms of, you know, what it's doing about perception and what it's doing about its own ecological reality, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's the, the contribution, you know, there's, there's what the industry needs to do. But at this point in time, it makes sense as an individual business to be planning for this. And it is from, from, from the, you know, from the perspective of, of keeping your business viable and sustainable, we're not just talking about reducing your emissions. We're, we're really talking about planning for the impact um, that the climate crisis is going to have on on network, on demand, on price, on cost. You know, it, it, it's actually about keeping the business alive. We're not we're not just talking about reduction of emissions here. No, I mean, there's, no, there's definitely a, a survival element. There is a kind of a planning for the worst. And I think airlines also know their own customers. I mean, you know, airlines in Northern Europe, for instance, they understand their customers and their customers' own preoccupations. And so the public messaging you see from them and the behavior is maybe somewhat different from what you see from maybe North American Absolutely, carriers. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, with the exception of, you know, there, there are some North American carriers like Air Canada that are taking quite a leadership oh, sure, role yeah. now. Yeah. In, in that space but yes absolutely the, but that that always comes in waves so, so it starts somewhere and, and you know the Scandinavian countries might be a little bit ahead of the curve but it is spreading quite rapidly and um, there's a generational potentially a generational element to that as well that that younger generations just tend to be a lot more aware and concerned with that and airlines that are looking at their, their customers that you know there's a obviously a very profitable customer base that is in a, a older stage of life at this point in time but if you look at total um, value for the lifetime of the customer it's those younger generations that they are actually working on on reeling in and and building connections with now and so you, i think we'll see a lot more of that um in terms of marketing in terms of how airlines are positioning themselves because that's the customers of the future and, and kind of circling it back to the the sort of technologies that we get involved in um it seems to me that there have been some tentative steps to making intermodal connections and intermodal travel a reality um things like you know easy jet with um, yeah. for example yeah but i think there's there is definitely scope to expand that greatly um I, I i think as you said a moment ago Bert, um within europe i think it's going to be increasingly untenable to support flights of less than 500 700 kilometers something like that and 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 there is going to be a 
great deal of pressure to push that traffic onto rail. However, they're going to have to connect. If they want to fly across the Atlantic, you can't take a train to New York, not yet. Um, so the, the need for a much smoother integration of the different modes of transport, I think that's going to be quite a focus over the next year or two um, for some of the technology vendors we're working with. Yeah, I really agree with that. It's it's surprising. It's quite shocking that in this day and age, the rail and, and aviation are so disjointed, especially in Europe, where there's such a great rail network. You know, apart from a few coaches here and there, it really is a disjointed experience if you're trying to combine them. You know, there's nothing quite like the driver of necessity, and this could be the thing mm. that kind of breaks down those barriers and, and makes things that were maybe not considered profitable enough or not viable and um, brings those those within reach. And I think there is also um, a kind of an upside to this. I, we tend to focus a lot on the the kind of the limiting, the limits and the impacts and so on this is likely to have. But I think that, you know, what a lot of people are trying to, to highlight is the opportunities that exist in green economy. And I think airlines need to be looking as much as they can at what the opportunities are there as well. And I say to anyone who will listen that, Airlines really are in a unique position. There are so many industries which currently are emitting a lot of greenhouse gases that have alternatives, mm. that you can electrify industries, you can move them onto a, onto a different basis. For the foreseeable future, if you need to fly across an ocean, there is no alternative to burning a liquid fuel in a jet engine. There, there, there just isn't. Maybe in 20, 30, 40 years' time, there might be. Airlines are going to go on burning fuel as long as they're allowed to exist. The mindset needs to be, how do we get the maximum utility from the mm. amount of fuel we're able to, to, to use to burn? Someday, maybe governments are going to start rationing fuel. That's not something anyone's talking about yet, but it, it could happen. So you may find that airlines have got just an allowance of fuel they're, they're able to burn, and they've got to think about how they can deploy that best to support their business. And part of it is, I'm sure, going to be forging more intermodal connections so that they don't squander their precious fuel allowance on journeys that could be managed some other way. But also, so the technology we were talking about earlier with predictive analytics Maybe the concept of a schedule is going to become a little bit outdated because just just because you've you've said told everybody that you're going to have a flight at this time on this day um, every day of the week, that may not be what's optimal. And if the flight is only fifty percent busy on on certain days, maybe you don't operate or you don't you're not allowed to operate that flight anymore. These things we might see regulation around as well. And there's a lot of opportunity to optimize total utilization of the aircraft i'm thinking as well of passenger and cargo they tend to be treated very differently but actually there's, there's probably a lot that technology can do to help avoid waste and and space on a plane flying unoccupied and unutilized some of the biggest airlines in the world don't carry any passengers at all exactly we three at least are agreed that the the climate crisis is is definitely real. It's definitely going to have a substantial impact. But I think we're also agreeing that it, it will bring some opportunities as well. And it's up to airline managers, airline you know airline owners, to think about both the opportunities and the threats from from the climate crisis. And and I, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing how they do that over the next several years. We're kind of coming to the end of the time that we've uh, we've set aside for this conversation. So, just to to kind of finish up, I want to ask each of you what you see, or if you see any other externalities, any other outside forces that are going to have an impact on our industry. Maybe looking slightly further ahead, um, are there any new technologies coming along? You know, are we going to see airlines replaced by Elon Musk's Hyperloop? Uh, answer no, but um, are, are, there, are there any other influences that are, are, are going to be brought to bear on, on our industry over the next few years? Can I just say, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see what happens with uh, electric aircraft. Looking at it from, from my previous roles where, you know, solving problems on, on how we get passengers from point A to B, I think that opens up a lot of opportunity for some airlines if you have the right 
geographical um, setup. You know, th- there's countries where it, it, it is not helpful. I'm really excited to see what where that's going to go. And it's not that far away. I mean, there are airlines that are planning to have flights take off 2026. Um, it, it really isn't that far away. So in the next five years, it will be experimental. It will start off slow, but I think that will really take off. And I think looking at it from a, a revenue management and a network and how do we get passengers to the right destination that can actually be within miles of where they're trying to get to as opposed to an airport two hours away once we start looking at smaller aircraft. I think that's really, really interesting um, as a as a problem to crack. What I, I think we don't appreciate yet is the sort of the compounding effects that some of these um, issues that we're seeing today will have. So when you look at the climate crisis and the weather events and and, and when you combine those and the potential knock-on effects that that will have, there are talks about what, what does that mean in terms of um, resources, bioresources, the lack of availability of bioresources when crops fail, when things that we could normally access from Ukraine aren't available to buy anymore, etc. These things will cause tensions between countries and more more diplomatic issues, um, potentially less trade or less travel, etc. And I don't think we fully appreciate how these things can add on and compound and have an effect on the industry. And we won't see that play out for another, you know, 10, 15 years. But it, it, it's not going to get any easier, that's for sure. There's also a lot of opportunity out there. It's a difficult one. I, I, I loathe crystal ball gazing of this kind because crystal balls are so distorting of the future. I, you know, the, the biggest impacts I still think are going to be um, economic and geopolitical. And it, it's difficult not to be pessimistic <laughs> um, at certain times. You know, I think that there are bubbles waiting to burst around the world and whether those are uh, economic or fragile peace um, is is difficult to say, but the reality is that none of those things are new necessarily. I mean, you know, the, the the world has had to go through those kinds of ructions in the past. The things that are new and that are mounting, or certainly in this kind of industrial cycle, are you know, are the climate crisis, and I think that is that is going to be one of the big shaping impacts on the industry. I don't think that we will people will ever lose the the will, the desire to travel. On the one hand, we've got supersonic planes being touted. And then on the other hand, we've got people starting to talk about maybe there should be a return to the golden age of the airship and people should travel more slowly. Um, the answer is who knows? This kind of prognostication, I'm never sure how useful it is. There's, there's some certainty, though. There's, there's certainty that there will be change and there will, there's certainty that there will be need to adapt you know, very quickly to, to developing situations. Mm. And so you can plan around that and you can plan for your workforce, for your technology, for your your network, your everything can be geared towards that agility that is going to be required for businesses to to thrive in the in the next few years. Definitely. That in itself is a is a is a really sound strategy. Um, how do you set yourself up to solve these problems of tomorrow? Yeah, I think one of the things that we've learned recently is that flexibility, the ability to do things on much shorter cycles, to be more responsive and adaptive, you know, to be able to publish a schedule every week instead of every six months, uh, to pivot, those kinds of things. And I think some of the technologies that we have talked about could be the things that enable us to unlock being able to respond in far more dynamic ways to whatever changes falls to pass. Just to pick up on on something you just said, Bert, whether prognostication is useful Mm. is an interesting question. And you may be right, maybe it's not, but it's certainly interesting and uh, entertaining for those of us who uh, engage in it. So I think we've had a pretty pretty good conversation. Thank you very much to to Bert and to Yuna for being up very early in the morning in New Zealand. If this podcast is of interest to you, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, We're on all the major podcast platforms and you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. For me, Ian Tunnicliffe, uh, and from T2RL, we thank you for your attention and we look forward to talking to you again on the next edition of T2RL Talks. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thank you.